it's 7.1 and 8.1. In 7.1, I first had to understand thoroughly the quantitative formula for obtaining the deseasonalized demand that was talked about in Chapter 7. And I had to understand how to get um, d sub t to equal d sub 1. In doing that, we start with the beginning of the equation of d sub t minus p over 2. Well, p stands for periods, and here we're working with January through December, where seasons seasonality fluctuates through every month and there's a different demand for every month. We're wanting to obtain a different demand for every month. And so we have 12 periods there, uh, January through December. So our P equals 12, as we already have here, it's a given. Um, but plugging that in, we obtain D sub T um, to equal D sub 1 and we get that T is equal to 7 and so we begin with the month of July. If we look at this, we'll see the equation that I got from doing the procedure for the deseasonalized man. Where I took D sub 7 minus P over 2 or 12 over 2 plus D sub 7 plus 12 over 2 plus the sum of 2 di where i equals 2 all the way up through 12. And so here we have C5 which is D1, the demand in period 1, plus C17 which is the demand in period 13 which is January the next year. Um, plus 2 times the sum of the demand in period 2 all the way through the demand of period 6 over 24 um, the number of periods times 2 okay and all I did was I just took that formula plugged it in and then just copied it all the way down through period let me show you through period 54 and the reason why I did this is because we weren't able to start until period 7 um, by using this equation. And when we take it past period 54, the latter part of the equation, um, the 2di part, it just it, it doesn't make any sense. It goes beyond the information that we have. And... Um, we, we cannot go past period 54 in just doing this equation. So now I don't have the regression function on my computer. I, I had to go into the school and use the computer lab because I do own a MacBook and the analysis tool pack for regression even to this day um, is unfortunately not available for Mac. You can't buy it, you can't get it, can't download it. It's just simply not available. And I've encountered that in past classes. So, anyway, I went in to do it on the computer lab. And what I did was I put in this deseasonalized demand information that I got from doing the quantitative math. And I did a regression analysis through the tool pack. And these are my results. First off, we want to look at regression statistics. Pretty high. They're very close to 1, which that's good. Um, what, from what I've learned, that means that our demand that we're getting is following pretty closely. Um, this significance right here, as you can see, is a very, very, very low number. E minus 31. Um, very low. And that's also a good sign. But the two numbers that we do want to use are the intercept and the x variable, or our level and our trend. Let's go back to this data sheet. And going forward, we took the level and the trend, and we built a new demand analysis. We took the level plus the trend that we got from our regression analysis, and we multiplied it 
by the period. And all I did was I took this down. As you can see, let me go forward. See the level and the trend? They stay the same. They're from the same analysis. The only thing that changes here is the period. And I took it all the way down. Took it down. Took it down into year six through period 72. In six years. And that's the demand based on the regression. For the seasonal factor, how I obtained that was I took the demand that was given and I multiplied it by the demand based on the regression analysis. And that's how I obtained the seasonal factor. And what this tells me is um, 0.33 is what is related to um, the demand in a season. This is the this is the demand that we can relate to seasonal demand. I went a step further and I did the average seasonal factor. Now the seasonal factor as you can see repeats itself every 12 months every January it's 0.43 every February it's 0.47 you see all the way down through period 72 it repeats itself period 72 we have a seasonal factor of 1.09 every December and how I obtain this if we look we've got an equation here we add up all the Januaries and we divide them by how many Januaries do we have? Well, we have five. Okay, in what was given, in the information that was given. And see Februaries. I added up all the February seasonal factors and I divided them by five. I didn't round them off, nothing. March, added up all the March, divided them by five. Now when I went down here to the sixth year, I just continued it down. I didn't divide it by six. Maybe I should have done that. And I know that I, I still have some things to work out with this spreadsheet. And that's something that I'm going to try over the weekend and kind of play with. And see where that gets me. We didn't get that far in our video lectures or in the textbook. Um, but I'm going to play around with it. So in our forecasted demand, all we do is we take the demand that we got from the regression analysis and we multiply it by the average seasonal factor. So for January, period one, we've got the demand from the regression in period one times the seasonal factor, the average seasonal factor for January. Now let me fast forward to January of the second year. So we have the demand based on regression of January of the second year times the average seasonal factor for January. Okay, and that goes on down through period 72. There's always forecast error and we always want to keep that in mind. Um, forecast error tells us, you know, how how far we are from being right. In this, I didn't really know what to think of these numbers. They seemed pretty large to me. Maybe they're not, but I have a forecast error of 588.42 when my demand is only 2,000. So my forecast error is a fourth of my actual demand. Um, I thought that was kind of large. I'm still trying to understand these numbers, but how we obtained that was we took the forecasted demand and we subtracted the demand that we were given here. And I just took that on down. Now, as you notice, there are some negative numbers here. We can't deal with negative numbers. We, ha we have to have an absolute number. And what this 
column is, is it's the same numbers but in absolute values. And that's important. Here, for the mean square error, all we did was we took the, um, the sum of the forecast and we went from January through November and we divided it by the period. And here we went through January through December divided by the period which would be 2. And here we went through January and January of the next year. As you see we always add a month as we go down and we divide it by the period that we're in. As you can see that would be period 3. And then for the MAD, we get back here. What we did was we took the absolute sum and divided it by the period. So for period one, we have the absolute forecast error, absolute number forecast error, divided by the period. Here we have in period two, we have the sum of the absolute forecast error in period one and two. And as you see, you just keep adding as you go down. And it accumulates. In 8.1, we dealt with a very different problem. This talks about um, aggregate planning strategies. And here we use Solver. We were given a subcontract price of $28 an hour. Let me get to my data here, which we plugged in. Um, subcontracting cost, $28. Go forward to the production plan. We had all these set to zero except our workforce which we knew was constant of 1,250 workers and our inventory which we knew began with 50 and that we would also end with 50. We set our total cost to be the sum of all the hiring, all the layoff costs, time, overtime, inventory, stock out, subcontracted rate, and material. All this right here. And these are tied to this information given here and this information given here. As we can see, our material cost per unit is 20. Inventory holding cost is 3. Um, regular time is 20. And overtime um, of 10 would equal 30. Um, or overtime is 50% is of regular time, which would equal 30. And then our subcontracting cost, which is 28. Our workforce, 1250 and um, starting inventory and ending inventory, 50. Those are the numbers we're paying attention to. So we come over here, on this one I did use solver. Okay, I set the objective, the total cost, 
to be minimized. That's the whole point of aggregate planning, is you want to find out what is the least you can spend while meeting the, the constraints um, or while meeting the objectives and um, sub subject to the constraints. So here I have by changing the variable cells so we have um, over time inventory um, and then the subcontracting right which I put in all these sales in inventory and over time and production as well and I subjected them to these constraints of um, over time and inventory they have to be greater than zero um, inventory at the end must equal 50. Um, subcontracting rate has to be greater than zero. That's in there twice. I didn't mean for that to happen. Um, our inventory level must be greater than zero. And also our inventory over here, the constraints are equal to zero and over time in production greater than zero. I used simplex and I solved to get a total cost of $357,450,000 and per unit cost of $25.17. Now I did this formula several times. I worked with this sheet several times and I continue to come up with these rates. I do believe they are correct. Um, oops, I don't know what I did there, but I'll fix it. Um, it looks like I went back to the original, which that's great because I need the extra practice. <laughs> but um, I do believe that those numbers were correct. The numbers that I'm thinking I may have gotten wrong were when I used the regression analysis because I know I missed a few on the quiz. So, um, and it's looking like I did something here. So, oh, or maybe not. Well, okay. So things are getting a little confusing here. <laughs> Looks like I need to do more work. I don't know what the heck's going on. My computer's going crazy. Um, but like I said, I. Uh, did the regression analysis um, at the University of Arkansas Computer Lab and uh, worked from home for several days on these spreadsheets and watched the videos, went over the textbook, went over the quantitative formulas and uh, I think I got it. I understand it. I definitely understand the theory behind it. I understand the math behind it. It's just getting those numbers to come up right is what I'm struggling with. So. Anyway, thank you for watching, and uh, sorry it's late. <laughs> thank you.